and good morning and welcome. So I um, wanted to say thanks for, for joining us first. And then um, originally, we're going to call this uh, session Ideas for Hybrid Instruction. What we're doing uh, isn't quite hybrid, right? And so we thought, oh, well, what about blended instruction? Uh, it's not quite a thing either. Um, it, it was already a thing before. Um, uh, COVID hit, this isn't quite that either. Um, then the, the term concurrent instruction has been going around, you know, and um, there's some issues with the mathematical definition of that. And so here, here's what I settled with, uh, simultaneous instruction, right? So um, semantics, whatever, let's just go with um, ideas for simultaneous instruction. I think it's a, it, it captures what uh, you're going to start doing on, on Monday. So uh, we'll go with that. And with uh, uh, T minus five days until that happens, uh, you probably are feeling something like, like this, right? Like, wait, you want me to do what? And then the man comes along and is, you know, throws, throws out some kind of new buzzword and a new expensive toy to help you do it. And then says, what's so hard about that? Right. And so, so that's the, the context for, why well, I put together some of these things here. Um, so this is our objective for this morning. Um, from the learner perspective, uh, today I'll consider some ideas for, uh, just take care of that. Okay, so uh, consider some ideas and strategies and techniques for this simultaneous instruction that we're gonna be doing. The reason for this is to help ease some of the stress and anxiety that might come from this transition. And your success criteria for today, so if, you know, I, I know I got it, if um, I can use some of these resources that I'll be sharing with you today, right? Um, the thing I, I do wanna emphasize though is uh, there should not be a need for you to double the work. So do double planning. And that's what I wanna emphasize. So. Um, it, you know, this was a, a book was written on simultaneous instruction and was just published. And I was like, wait a minute, how do you, no, no one's done this before. How are you publishing a book on this? And the, the whole uh, uh, point of the book was we know what works in, in uh, distance learning. We know what works in face-to-face -face learning. Let's leverage those things. And so with that in mind, here we go. Here's what we'll be looking at. Uh, the first four of these links uh, will take you to, um, uh, you know, these different topics. The last one is just, uh, you know, some resources for you. Um, you have a copy of this, so you can skip ahead, you know, if you, if you want to take a look at something more specifically, or if you signed up for the um, uh, Amy Bodner's uh, session later today. That one's designed to like just go and explore and, and plan, right? And so you have some resources for that. Okay, so let's start with the the technical stuff, visualizing some of these technical things that we um, have to consider. And um, we'll start with uh, the the classroom setup. And by now you've all been in your classroom and you've probably been playing around with some of the technology. So here's one. Um, that's so complicated way to do this. And by the way, if you haven't muted yourself, make sure you do because it'll do some weird uh, feedback. You know, and there's uh, uh, over a hundred people in here, so it'll, you know, it, it can get kind of crazy there. But man, I don't miss that bell. Do you guys? <laughs> so, um, so classroom uh, uh, setup. Uh, this is kind of what I'm doing, right? So I have this Promethean board behind me. And I logged into that through the OPS. So you go to the source OPS. I'm on the uh, computer that's on board. In that computer, I logged in as myself, logged into Google uh, Meet, joined from there, and I'm presenting from there. I muted it, turned the camera off, turned the volume down uh, all the way off on this, on this Promethean board. And then I did the exact same thing um, but with the volume on, and I have a, a, a mic in my ear here, um, just for my own convenience, but I, I did that with my laptop, and that's, when I'm, that's where my camera is, so you can still see my beautiful face, and 
the uh, um, and the presentation. So my imaginary in class students can see this uh, presentation just as well as you can see the exact same presentation at the same time. Okay, so that's that's the setup I came up with. I also have an extra uh, laptop or an extra Chromebook just on the side so I can keep an eye on the chat in case something happens. And that's just a, a, a me being neurotic kind of thing. Like that's not really necessary, but, um, and especially I'll, I'll have a little trick for you later where you don't even ever have to pay attention to the chat ever again. <laughs> okay. Um, but, uh, but more on that later. Okay. Um, oh, and if your students are in person are also, um, on on devices you're going to want them to mute and turn the sound off because then you'll get crazy feedback as well okay or have headphones on all right okay <laughs> control yeah i do i do have control issues um th this is another setup it's very similar but with one extra thing and you might have this also so i told you i have the camera off on my promethean board right um that's because it wasn't it was never installed so it just doesn't have a camera but if it did it would be up here somewhere like you probably have right um and so what this teacher did is she um uh turned it on and uh, her, uh, you know, so I like to call them the meters and the seaters. So the kids in person in the seat are the seaters. Kids on meet are the meters, right? So the camera is on the seaters, so the meters can see the seaters. Okay, so that's one extra little level of uh, uh, complexity if you want to do that. Um, she also has her camera on at a weird angle, and so when you, you saw what she was doing, you know, it was kind of a funny angle, so, you know, you might want to use a tripod or a lectern podium or something, right? Um, there's one more if you have a webcam that's not um, necessarily the one that's attached to the Promethean board, or if you find an extension for it. Uh, to me, that's just one more tripping hazard, and so I, you know, I tried to avoid that, but Anyway, there, there's one more. All right, so uh, speaking of the Promethean board, um, the, uh, I'm using the least complex method to, to present from it to, to both sets of, uh, you know, the meters and the seeders. Um, and that's what I had just explained. And I explained it pretty quickly. There's a, a less than five minute video explaining how I did that there for you to peruse later. The second uh, least complex method is to share your screen from your laptop onto the Promethean board. So then you're not using the onboard computer on the uh, Promethean board, but you are using what's on your computer. So maybe you have some software you wanna use. There's a video that explains it there. This was made by Promethean. So if you click on the link, scroll to video number 43, and it's, uh, I think it's like five minutes and it'll explain how to how to share your screen. And you can also have your students share their screen to your board if you want. The most complex way, but actually kind of cool, um, and if you want to venture into this, is to use the whiteboard feature and present that to your students. Here's a video explaining how to do that. What I don't include in the video is that you do have to have the Google Play Store pre-installed in the Promethean board. And so if you don't have that, it, it, it's supposed to be there. So you can email Gary Allen directly and he, he's the one who has to launch it. So once you have the Google Play Store on the Promethean, you download uh, Google Meet from it. And, and that's the key to using that. All right. But a video explaining how to do that right there. This one's actually like three minutes. So it, once you have all the things set up, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, speaking of videos, uh, you know, this isn't a Promethean training. We, there's one of those going on right now all day long, right? But uh, the, the guy who's running those and Ben Jefferson put together these uh, quick little videos. Um, and so there's a link to those videos explaining things and they keep adding um, stuff. So as people ask Barrett Graf questions, he'll put his recording answers and um, him and Ben are putting them together. So if you click on that link and then go to um, uh, the, the little drop down on Google Drive, when it, when it takes you there, go to add shortcut to drive. 
it'll just be in your Google Drive. And because of the way Ben named it, uh, it'll be at the top of your drive, so it'll just be easy to find for you, okay? So that's there. Um, if you're feeling really ambitious, there's two links there to learning um, uh, different uh, cool things that you can do with the Promethean board, even getting a certification, you know, like the Google certification thing. So those, those are there for you, all right? The second thing I wanted to kind of bring to your attention is um, establishing predictable routines and procedures. And, you know, as, as teachers, you all know, that's an important thing to do all the time, right? And so I um, wanted to show you one that has been very helpful. And so this is the first one. It's called the <clears throat> Procedure Potpourri. Right? Um, and so I, I've used this in the past for, with, with different uh, um, uh, teachers, but here's, here's how it's supposed to work. It can work one of two ways. One way, option A, is uh, you visualize what the expectation for your students are, right? So let's say beginning uh, the class. So what is the, what are your expectations for the in-person students? It really helps to spell it out for yourself and then communicate that to your students. So how do you visualize students coming in, you know, do they, do they pump some uh, hand sanitizer as they're walking in? Do you want them to go find, you know, a Chromebook and take it to their, you know, whatever it is that you want, um, spell it out. Because then you can communicate it clearly to your students. Do the same thing for the online students, right? Or option B, now that you've probably already developed a relationship with your students by this time of the year, you can um, do this second, um, uh, saying the co-creation. So you can assign this to students, uh, mixed groups of meters and seeders in breakout rooms and have them develop what those procedures should look like. Then they have um, some input, right? And then they take that uh, shared document and they turn that in as a group. And you as a teacher have veto power, of course, right? And you have the ultimate say, but this way you can have their input. And uh, they may have a teacher who has a really great idea on how, they, how things work and they may let you know, right? And so it's, a, I think, a, a good activity to get students uh, uh, input on um, on the rules and procedures. The, um, it's very similar to the social contract idea, right? And so I have that there also with a, uh, a blended uh, model version of it. And also this other set of templates for co-creating um, norms and expectations for your students. So uh, there's all that for you. Speaking of uh, procedures and routines, um, this has been a real fun activity I've, I've, I've done with teachers uh, in the uh, in the past in, in the before times, right? Before COVID and before distance learning. But uh, this might be a good opportunity to um, to use it. So the uh, the idea is you give the students the procedures after you know after having been established and after. Um, coming back from a break, for example, or in this case, you know, this new transition to a new type of classroom, you can uh, uh, give them the list of procedures and have them photograph what it what the do looks like and what the do not looks like. Now, uh, you know, keeping social distancing guidelines in mind, that might be a little difficult, but they can do image searches for what, uh, for example, what the warm up looks like there, right? So when we're doing the warm up, it should look like this. It should not look like this. And then they can create a funny meme to um, reinforce the idea or something like that, right? So there is that, okay? Um, the other the other key is to keep your Google Classroom well organized. Still, um, give you some ideas on how to do that there. Um, and then, speaking of predictable routines, this has been very helpful uh, for a lot of teachers doing something like this, 
um, where at the beginning of class, since you have students staggering in at, at, at different times, right, um, during distance learning, it probably would be, will be the same um, in this blended model we're doing, the simultaneous stuff, where uh, your in-person students might not all show up at the same time either, right? Um, and so this has been really helpful. Uh, where you have like a set amount of time with a timer, you might increase that to 10 minutes, but you, you have everything the students would need from the objective to an agenda, the materials that students are going to need for the day and some kind of warm up activity, right? Um, so students will know that after those 10 minutes are up, now we're going to get started with the lesson, right? All right. Um, and then here is uh, a couple of ideas on organization. Um, so, you know, starting class in person, one of the great things that uh, um, I've liked to do is show students what things should look like. So at the beginning of class, if we're going to transition into, um, um, you know, like textbook note time or something like that. So once we, we transition into the, the lecture time or something, you know, just project this and say, okay, make your desk look like that. It's time to take notes, right? And so they try to imitate that. Um, uh, Chromebook, putting things away, you know, if you have a Chromebook cart or a tower or a table with a extension cord, whatever it is that you have, um, organize it the way you want it to look, take a picture of it, print it, and paste it right above, uh, or. Um, display it where it needs to happen so that at the moment, you know, you can say, make the Chromebook cart look like this. This is the Chromebook cart at the PCC. It was, you know, us as adults don't put them back the, the right way. And so I took a picture of it and put that on the door. Um, so make it look like that. This works at home too. My uh, wife has this over our toilet. So. All right, not really, but, but I, I, she probably would. Um, so uh, I, I was talking about putting students into into groups, right? Here's a way to do that, um, not using the um, the Google uh, the embedded Google Meet breakout room because that can get really complicated. And so here's this version of it. Um, uh, the, there is a uh, one quick new thing that wasn't included in the video, but that's uh, don't click in meeting for all because then students can't get back into it if you're going to reuse the link. Okay, so there's that. And you can watch that video and it'll help you um, go through that if you want. Um, all right, third thing we'll talk about is getting to know your students and building community. Um, these links are pretty self-explanatory. One of my favorites is using this uh, emoji, emotion um, uh, wheel. So you can just start off class by asking students something like that. I'm really bad at, at these, you know, just asking the questions, you know, like formally of students. And so um, I like ideas. So there's a list of 130 check-in questions. Um, that you can choose from, and, and I've found those to be very helpful. Right? So there's that. Uh, the emoji one, if you're using like Nearpod or Pear Deck or Classflow, you can have students like circle it you know, instead of like dragging the, the little circle. But, you know, Google Slides works just as well for that. Um, if you're into like teacher Twitter and, uh, you know, things like that, uh, this blogger, um, has a lot of really great ideas. And so there's a link to uh, Esther Park's uh, blog where she talks about ways to make this work. All right, next thing we wanna talk about is clarity and, and planning. Um, so experts, um, uh, John Hattie had wrote this book. I don't know if you're familiar with, with his work, but um, his book is called Visual, uh, Visible, Learn Visible Learning. And so what, what he's done is just sat in classrooms um, all over the world, mostly in the US and Australia, and uh, kind of looked at what works, right? And he's created this rating system. And anyway, experts agree, and he's one of these experts, that if students can answer those three questions on, on uh, the left side of your screen there, 
um, if they can answer those three questions, the, they, their learning can potentially double or the rate of learning can potentially double, sometimes even triple, if they can know that for each day. So here's uh, three ways to, to communicate that. Um, if you're at Lancaster or Eastside, I think you're supposed to use that first one anyway. And so, hey, it's, you know, it's research backed, right? And so uh, the difference between all three, I think is just a, a preference. The first one I think is very, uh, observer friendly so if somebody walks into your classroom and they see that they, they can predict what's going to happen you know and, and they, they know what's what's happening in, in class um, the the middle one i think is very teacher friendly so very teacher um, developed and, and teacher designing friendly right and so <clears throat> you know you, you can just fill in the blanks of what you want the students to do What's the task you want them to use, the tool you want them to use, and things like that. Um, the third one is very student friendly. I, that one's my favorite too. And somebody said number three is their favorite. Yeah, I, I like that one too because it's 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 less wordy. It's a little simpler for for me, and uh, the the students tend to understand it a little better too. Here's um, an example of one lesson used. You know, um, uh, interpreted by all three there. Um, so, you know, and this isn't a new concept, like now that we're doing distance learning, we should be clear. No, this is this has always been a thing, right? But um, uh, this helps, and it helps regardless of the environment. And so there's that. All right. Um, another way that it's that that is used is uh, by giving students this um, success criteria sheet. And so what uh, uh, students would end up doing is filling out one of the columns. And so you can click on the, the template there and, and look at that. The, the second one I think is the better one where you give students what the learning intention is, right? So this is what I want you to learn. And this is how you can prove that you, you know it and then students fill in the relevance, like how that's gonna be useful. Or you could leave out any of the columns and have the students fill it out as they, as they go. All right. Um, speaking of clarity, rubrics are always good. One of the real popular um, types of rubrics that's been coming, around, coming along here is this idea of the single point rubric. And so if you've been in uh, uh, induction with us over the past couple of years, you, you, we've used this with you or on you, I guess, but we didn't call it that. The idea is, and let me click on it to just kind of show you what it looks like. The idea is that you give students only the proficiency uh, column, right? And then they treat it more as a checklist. And so you tell them, turn it in after these things are done. And then what you end up getting is proficient work every time, right, in, in the perfect world. Um, but because no one is perfect, there's two columns on the side. Uh, the column on, uh, um, on, on the, the areas that need work side here um, is a space where you can write down, okay, this is what you need to do to get into the proficiency column, you know, and give them some ideas there. If you have this, those students who are like, hey, uh, Mr. Rivas, where's the plus next to my A, right? It gives them a way to earn that plus also, right? To go above and beyond proficiency, right? And so that's been uh, very helpful recently, I think. And so um, anyway, give you some more information on how to use that. It's great for self-assessment too, for students to just assess themselves and, and assess each other because it's very clear, it's, it's very checklist-like, right? Speaking of checklists, checklists are also very uh, helpful with, with clarity. So I'll give you some ideas there on how to use checklists, especially what, what I, I've, I've seen some teachers call it the obnoxiously detailed numbered checklist and kind of give you the uh, details on how that works right there. You can read that on your own. Now let's look at some synchronous stuff. So doing things at the same time. Um, and so here's, here's the, uh, the cool new things you could do is involve the seeders, right? Um, have someone be your chat monitor 
oftentimes when we have like really large things like this, I like to have someone be my chat monitor, my, you know, my wingman, Ben, uh, you know, I'm his wing, we're each other's wingman. He's, he's doing a, another PD so we couldn't do that. And so it would have been nice to have someone uh, do that. But, um, you know, if you have someone in the room, you could say, hey, you are in charge of the chat. So let me know when someone says something, you know, or asks a question. Um, or I, I do this all the time and I, I hope I haven't even done it. Have I been muted this whole time? You know, like, <laughs> have, have you done that? Or you're presenting the wrong screen, right? You can have someone in the room in charge of just, you know, just that. So if you tell me when I'm presenting the wrong screen, right? All right. You can even devise a some sort of a, a buddy system between a meter and a seater, right? Where um, you know they they uh, encourage each other or have uh, take notes for each other if the other one's not there, you know that that sort of thing. So um, involve involve the seaters. Um, here's some collaboration ideas now. Um, the first one is this idea of a roundtable. Um, for discussion. Uh, again, not a new concept, but I've seen it uh, work really well in distance learning and it should, it, you know, in theory, work pretty well in, in this blended model too. And so during your lecture, you take, or, or your direct instruction or, you know, whatever it is you're doing with, with students, you have students take their own notes in the my notes section, right? Then you break them up into breakout rooms and each person shares what they, you know, what they wrote down for their notes. So if I'm in a group with Joe, then Joe tells me, oh, here's what I wrote. And then I write down what he, what he wrote or I type out what he wrote. Same thing with Nick and Kevin. And then at the end, um, I either I summarize what everyone said or we all work together to come up with a collaborative summary. But uh, again, it's, it's not a new concept, but it's something that has been working and um, sh ideally should work in this blended um, model too. The, the other oldie but goodie is this concept of reciprocal teaching. And what this is, is um, giving students specific jobs. So like today your job is to predict and your job is to summarize, your job is to clarify, your job is to question and then get into a group, take the text or the set of problems or whatever it is that you're working with, the lab, the lab results, whatever it is you're studying, and each student does one thing. And this is just a, a sample of jobs. You might have more specific jobs. You might have the translator or the um, connector or something like that, right? Um, and then you have students rotate the jobs, right? Uh, and this works real well in this next thing, the uh, jigsaw, and um, the, you know the, the the book I was referencing, Visible Learning, um, has this rated super high. So one of the really effective uh, strategies, when done well, is this jigsaw strategy, right? And again, nothing new. There's you know this is not a new concept, right? But the idea is that um, each student is represented by a different uh, dot and each dot has a different color, and the color represents a job that the students are supposed to do, right, with a common text. And then they break up into a second group of experts, and those expert groups do the same job on that same text and make sure that each person in that group can teach that. And then they go back to their home group and reteach it, right? Um, gave you a couple of, uh, 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 ideas on how to implement that uh, on this slide, right? including if you go up here, it'll take you to a, a, a document with a video, I, I believe. I believe that one, one of them has a video. All right, now something that's more uh, for what we're doing here, and if you're trying to do something a little bit ambitious, or if you've ever taught Read 180, this may sound a bit familiar. So the, the concept with this virtual rotation station model is that your class comes together, all together, right? Um, meters and seeders together to do some sort of whole group thing. And then um, students are put into groups and they rotate into these stations. 
So the first station is the teacher-led station. That's where you do some direct instruction with a small group of students, meters and seeders, or just seeders if, you know, if that works for you better, or just meters or whatever the case may be. But you have a group of students where um, <clears throat> you do some direct instruction, one-on-one, -on -one, troubleshooting, giving feedback, maybe um, um, uh, write, uh, improving the writing and things like that. At the same time, you have another group of students doing independent online work. Maybe it's something um, enriching, like or something through Edpuzzle, an assignment through um, some other multimedia thing where they have to watch a video. Maybe it's a student-based Nearpod, something like that, something online. At the same time, a third group is doing an offline task. Maybe it's reading the chapter maybe it's taking notes on the chapter maybe it's you know uh maybe it's tech involved maybe it's non-tech involved maybe it's go not stare at a screen for 20 minutes you know um and then uh you rotate jobs this might go through um several days but uh what some of the researchers say is that this it can be very effective right um and then this teacher who created this um created a, a extension activity. So it's essentially, um, I don't know if you, if you do this, if you have a, I finished early poster. So if students ever finish early or something, here's, here's the approved things you can do, right? You can go through these three activities or these three tasks. So that's what, that's what that is, <clears throat> All right? So this is a bit ambitious, but um, pretty highly effective. And right now might be a good time to experiment with some of this. Um, you know, if next year looks like this, this might be a really effective thing to uh, implement. And I gave you a couple of links to articles that explain some best practices in this rotation model there. And now finally, we'll look at some engagement tools. So stuff you can use to help you with your, uh, with your um, simultaneous instruction. And um, when we think of engagement, it's useful to think of it on a continuum. Right? So students can be either actively disengaged or actively uh, engaged, and we want to move them towards active engagement. Right? And for each of these columns, uh, Amy Berry is the name of the researcher who, who came up with this. Um, what she found was that moving students from one column into the next, even if they're moving from avoiding into withdrawing, has um, some uh, gains in learning so e even even that small you know just get them to participate a little more um has has shown evidence that uh, uh learning and improves right and and again nothing revolutionary there right <clears throat> but um just before we go through um some of these um when we're thinking about asynchronous time um, it's great to have asynchronous time as, as bookends, is what some uh, researchers uh, have suggested. So um, you might have some preview and review at the beginning and retrieval practice at the, at the end. So it's okay to have asynchronous activities, you know, even when we're doing simultaneous uh, instruction, right? Um, in fact, the kids who are coming into class might benefit from time to work in an environment that lets them work, right? And you're providing that for them. So, so there's that. Um, but then, so you know, what are, what are some of these tools? Uh, one of the big ones that has been um, very helpful for teachers this year is doing interactive digital uh, notebooks. You know, and it's it's uh, nothing too revolutionary. It's just like having a spiral bound notebook with activities, but you can leverage everything that a Google um, slide has, right? And I'm um, not gonna belabor this because uh, Ms. Gadomsky and Ms. McCall put together a lovely set of um, instructions and resources that are linked here on this slide. <clears throat> All right. Um, and then here's some pro tips on implementing the uh, uh, digital notebooks. And I, I think the first one's real important. It's start small. If it's your first time, to do it on a lesson. You know, play around with it. Use one of the templates that's been already made and uh, 
you know, ha have your students even help you co-create it, you know, and uh, that's been, uh, so those are some, some helpful tips there. Uh, this is one of my favorites uh, that I've seen is the no show chart. This was new to me. It's probably not new to our elementary school brethren who've been using this really, you know, really effectively um, past year. And the idea is you, you go back to that success criteria, the objective, right? And you write down, here's what you should know in a, in a T column chart on one side, this is what you should know. Now show me that you know it, right? A simple concept, but you know, students can demonstrate learning in, in different ways. Um, so on, on this slide, I give you 100 activities that could work for that. One of the coolest ones I've seen is uh, using Flipgrid for this. So you know, the teacher will give them, here's what you should know by the end of today. And then she'll do the lessons, and then at the end says, "Okay, now show me that you know these things." So here's um, this is just a cute 15 second video. Um, the sound's not very good. Oh well. So I'm just uh, just a proud papa. That's my daughter, a fifth grader, doing that exact activity about diffusion. Uh, they're they're studying molecules, and so she had to show that she understood what diffusion meant. And uh, she was talking about how perfume smells spreads. And you know, I just I just thought it was cute, and I just want to show off my cute little fifth grader. So anyway, you can watch that on your own over and over again, like I did. But you can watch it on your own. <laughs> All right. The other uh, similar to that is this concept of a teach back. Right, and so um, what, what you do it, the the example I gave you there is a good old fashioned uh, study guide, and you know how a study guide works. It's essentially a T chart with terms on one side, and then tell me what you know about it, what I or what I want you to know about it on the other side, right? And so what uh, a, a lot of the teachers I work with had, had used this uh, in, in a really great way was. Um, they gave that as a, a summative assessment um, where they said, okay, open book, open internet, open everything. Tell me, you know, you have 20 minutes to tell me everything you think I need you to know about these terms. Right, so they did that. And then the, the culminating assignment afterwards was pick the top five uh, of those terms and tell me why those are the most important terms and tell me what you know about them or what you think are the most essential parts of that. <clears throat> and uh, record it on a flip grid in 45 seconds. So you have 45 seconds to, to fit all that information. And the beauty of using flip grid and a 45 second uh, limit is that um, students have to do multiple takes to try to get it to 45 minutes, right? So you're kind of tricking them into studying as they're doing the test, right? And so they're processing the information. And so I, that, that was really effective. And, and um, I was really proud of the teachers who came up with this. And so we, uh, we, we had a good time with that. Um, it also, um, there's another version, and I, I've shared this before. You can you know, project a picture of you when you were uh, in fifth grade or something. That was me in fifth grade, I think. No, no, no. I was five years old. I was five years old there. <laughs> I hope I didn't dress like that in fifth grade. Maybe I did. I don't know. But, um, you know, it, you know, take even a self-deprecating picture like that one and then tell your students, okay, so we just studied Greek myth or Greek tragedy. Explain Greek tragedy as if you were explaining it to that nerdy kid, right? <clears throat> or, you know, you could use a picture of your own kids. The, um, um, some of the elementary uh, uh, folks uh, do this, but with a sock puppet. So they make they made the students create sock puppets that they teach things to, and it's really cute. They had to come up with a whole backstory for them, you know, to teach them narrative. It was it was great. It was great. All right. Um, the other uh, thing that's been very helpful is interactive um, uh, guided notes. So guided notes have been around for a while interaction during a lecture, you know, um, uh, you know, that the, the ancient Greeks were doing that, Jesus was doing that. It's, it's been around for a while, right? Um, but uh, here, you know, we can leverage some of the 
techie things that, that we have. So I, I like to call this one Poor Man's Nearpod. And all it is, is you give the lecture information, the, the stuff they need to process, the stuff from the expert to the kids, right, to, to, the, to the learners. And, um, you know, as they're writing it down, they have to do something with that information. So in this case, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we're talking about Greek tragedy. And I asked the students to dumb it down for little Miss Reva. So explain catharsis to uh, a, a five-year-old, right? So based on what I just gave you. And if they're still a little fuzzy, there's a video there that, that helps explain it to you. And I give you a template and, and a sample as well there. Um, and then three different versions of this, this interaction is uh, asking questions. So the first one is question with, with a period, right? So create questions, like a multiple choice question where you have option A, B, and C, and D, you know, and you have to have a correct option, a, a tricky option where if you're not paying attention, you, you could get that wrong, a clearly wrong one, and some something funny, for, for example, right? And uh, the, the concept there is that you give the information, and now I want you to process the information, put it on this slide. So give them space in that slide to do it. If you're using Nearpod or Pear Deck, it makes it even easier. But um, if you're just using Google Slides, that's all you need, right? Uh, give them a prompt and where, you know how to write it. Or question with a question mark. That's like legitimate questions. Like um, I just explained this. What questions do you have now? I had a professor who would go through a lecture. And then at the end of the lecture, he would ask, what questions do you have? And he was expecting specific questions. And if he didn't hear those specific questions, he would go back and reteach the entire thing. You know, and so, you know, maybe don't go that far. But, you know, that concept where you have, um, you know, I, I know what I want you to ask. Let's see if you ask those questions. Or the, the third version of that is question with an exclamation mark. Um, simply fill in this blank. I hope blank is not on the test. So after this information, what do you hope is not on the test? And that gives you a good idea of, well, what, is, you know, what, what do they still need to learn? All right. Um, everything I just explained, Nearpod and Pear Deck and Classflow, and to a certain extent, Edpuzzle do it a lot more seamlessly. Um, but there is a bit of a learning curve, right? Um, so if you're willing to take that learning uh, curve, um, you can, um, click on any of those uh, tutorials and learn a little bit more on how to use that, um, that tool that helps with, with those things specifically, all right? Uh, but wait, there's more, right? <clears throat> the, the concept of uh, uh, teaching back, summarizing, and demonstrating what you know, so the no show chart. Um, there was the, you know, 100 ways to show, and then here's another a list of, <clears throat> excuse me, a list of 30 of my favorite ways to assess student learning that I'm um, giving you there, all right? Okay, so <clears throat> the uh, last thing we'll look at is some of the challenges and solutions, and then I'll give you some time to, uh, you know, poke around all of this and ask questions if you had any, all right? So um, uh, social-emotional learning is, is, is a big buzzword and for, for good reason, right? Um, you know, <clears throat> we all have been traumatized in some way um, in the past year. Students are no different. There's a set of resources our counselors put together for focusing on social emotional growth um, in students. Um, uh, people are jumping on the simultaneous bandwagon, right? And so uh, the uh, publication company Corwin, who writes uh, or publishes uh, education books, partnered with a school and some researchers to record these videos uh, of you know what works well. A lot of the videos are mostly from elementary schools right now, but they they keep adding to them. Um, and so that's available to you. You do need a password, and it's the word engagement with a capital E. Right? And um, you can peruse through that, and um, there it's it's growing by the day, and so you, know, you, you have that for you. Um, <clears throat> one of the big names in blended learning is this professor at Pepperdine, who uh, Catlin Tucker, who's been promoting blended instruction for years. And so this is her time to shine. And so she's been producing a lot of stuff. And so I gave you some of her resources there. 
Um, and then, you know, you got to take care of yourself. So there's a video, or I'm sorry, a uh, link to uh, some ideas on balancing work life in this new teaching environment. And um, just a, a, a video from the teaching channel on making simultaneous learning work. Right? <clears throat> and I leave you with this, this, this lunch, you know, and it, I know I'm preaching to the choir with this and I, you know, if you're anything like me, the, the term learning loss, like just gets under your skin, like, ah, kids can still learn. They have been learning. I've been learning so much, you know, on a like <laughs> relevant personal level and, you know, all, the, all these things. Um, I heard somebody say this um, and it, it just resonated with me. What if we became strength spotters rather than deficit detectors, you know, and um, I just, I, I really like that. And so as we um, go through the, the, um, this new normal, as you know, they say, then, um, you know, just keep that in mind. Let's, let's look at what, what strengths our students have and let's leverage those strengths and use those strengths to help them learn better. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, good luck on this new journey and I will we'll stick around in case, uh, you have any questions. So, um,